Dune Part 1 and Part 2 are masterpieces of storytelling and cinema. I personally don't think I've ever been more immersed watching any other movie and especially in the cinema it's such a visceral experience. From a visual art perspective there are so many different sequences I could break down but in particular I want to talk about that Fade Rotha fight sequence on Gaty Prime. It's personally my favourite part across both movies and it's because of how alien and otherworldly everything feels in a film series where you literally have stuff like this. My desert. So let's take a further look and try to analyse what exactly makes the sequence so captivating and intriguing. We're going to be checking out some concept art, analysing some of the cinematography and also using this little scene I made in Blender to further explain some points. May thy paintbrush chip and shatter. The first and most obvious component of Fade Rother's fight sequence is that everything is black and white. Even though it isn't the first time we've seen Gaty Prime in the films, it is the first time we've seen it outdoors. You've probably heard by now that these scenes were filmed using an infrared camera instead of simply having the saturation turned down in the image. Cinematographer Greg Fraser explained that infrared cameras give a different kind of quality to a character's skin and features. They become a lot more translucent and we would not be able to see these qualities with the naked eye. Something I absolutely love in the sequence is that the use of black and white is also diegetic, meaning that it's not just a stylistic choice for us, the audience, but something that actually exists in the world of our characters. A huge aspect of Dune is the stark differences between all the houses and cultures, and particularly how they are influenced by their environment. For example, to understand the Fremen, all you need to look at is how they approach the desert. Desert power. When we think about the Atreides, we think about the vast richness and oceans of Caladan. Ocean power. On why Gaty Prime is black and white though, director Denis Villeneuve explains bald pa- no I'm just kidding. Denis explains, I wanted to find something that had the same evocative power and the same cinematic power for the Harkonnens. I wanted to be generous with their world and make sure that it will be singular. And it will inform us about where the political system is coming from, where their sensitivity, their aesthetic, their relationship with nature is coming from. The idea that the sunlight, instead of revealing colours, will kill colours, that their own world will be seen in a daylight as a bleak black and white world, will tell us a lot about their psychology. Now this contrasts very heavily with the Fremen who, unlike the Harkonnens, have a very deep respect for their land. What we are left with are very haunting images that gives us a deeper understanding of the brutality and viciousness of the Harkonnens. This interplay of light and dark is also known as chiaroscuro, where strong contrasts create really bold compositions. The origins of this technique can be traced back to the Italian Renaissance, emerging as early as the 15th and 16th century. The intro scene with Fade serves two functions. The first being an introduction to one of our main villains and his twisted psychology, but also to remind us of Gaty Prime's original colour palette as we saw in part 1, which are primarily made up of dark greys, blues and blacks. However, when the arena doors open on Fade and we actually see his face lose all of its colour, we start to understand that this is because of Gaty Prime's black sun. Now, whether or not this is something that actually occurs in real life, I actually have no idea, but I fully believe everything that I'm seeing in this sequence. And speaking of the lighting, another effect that it has is the use of this beautiful interplay of light and shadow in the frame. This entire sequence of this arena could have been lit completely flat, but this gives a really great opportunity to frame our characters and show the massive sense of scale that's present in this arena. When I think about Gaty Prime's Black Sun, I imagine everything feeling really cold even in the light, which is the polar opposite to the heat that you'd feel on Arrakis. Also, this is a complete side note, but does anyone remember that episode of the Powerpuff Girls where everything becomes black and white and the only way to introduce colour is for Bubbles to play a drum solo? Maybe that's a little bit of what the Harkonnens need. Now, the second thing that we can take a look at is the actual design of the Harkonnen structures and their architecture. In Dune Part 1, we caught a glimpse of Gaty Prime during the scene with the Reverend Mother and the Baron, but it's expanded upon a lot more in Part 2. I've heard some people refer to this architectural style as being brutalist, but I actually think that's more accurate to the buildings of Arakeen with its concrete geometry. Instead, the style of Gaty Prime invokes that of artist H.R. Giger, who is best known for his work on the original Alien. Now, what I find pretty interesting is that Giger himself was attached to Hodorowsky's cancelled 1970s Dune adaptation, where he provided these pieces of concept art. 
These were actually made before Giga worked in Alien and we can still see a lot of his signature staples here, from the elegant curve shapes to intricate repeating details and the overall oppressive feeling of the structure. And of course not to mention the weird biomechanical nature that we often see in Giga's work. It appears that some of these original design elements made their way back into Dune Part 2, which feels like things have come full circle. There are a lot of massive curved shapes that repeat in the distance, which again helps to convey the artificial nature of the Harkonnen world. Instead of desert sand and rocks, we're looking at a metal and plastic landscape. Gaty Prime is a place that has destroyed all of their natural resources in favor of production, and this philosophy seeps into every aspect of its design. On designing the look and feel of Gaty Prime, production designer Patrice Vermette used black septic tanks he saw in a field as its foundation. Denis had always envisioned Gaty Prime to be a world of black plastic, and I was driving in that day. Those black molded plastic septic tanks had this gloss, and there was a veil of dust on them. The way that the sun was hitting them, I was like, my god, this could be Gaty Prime. So I researched the moles with my concept artist. We started having fun redesigning the structure of those tanks. Even beyond the aesthetics, which were great, the meaning behind septic tanks and what's actually inside totally fitted with the Harkonnens themselves. When Fade steps out into the sunlight, we are shown the size and scale of the arena he is fighting in. It's pretty clear that this is not your typical sporting event. The crowd is relegated to a sea of faceless people, a giant mass, and the seats stretch up high. There must be something like hundreds of thousands of people in attendance for just this one person, their Nar Baron. On top of that, the Baron himself is seated even higher than the masses in his spectator's box, which itself looks like some kind of monument of worship. And check out these massive monuments surrounding him, almost as if they're directing our attention to what's actually important. It makes everything feel extremely grand and larger than life. I also have to mention the fireworks on display, which, just like the lighting, is done inversely. Instead of emitting light and sparkling out, they suck light in and create this weird ink blot effect. Also, I do want to give a special shout out to this comment here because, yeah, I agree that nightclubs must actually be insane. The design of the arena itself is also described as being triangular in the books. A Count and Lady Fenring were on the Harkonnen homeworld of Gady Prime for the event, invited to sit that afternoon with the immediate family in the golden box above the triangular arena. Now, although some combat sports in the real world actually do use triangular rings, this is still a unique piece of imagery because it's really something we don't see very often. The use of white sand as the arena's flooring is effective because it does make us think of ancient gladiators, heightening the sense of grandeur and spectacle of the event. If we take a look at some of the concept art of the arena, we can see that it's still fairly close to what's in the final film. Once again, there's a lot of symmetry and repeating shapes, which makes things feel even more artificial and foreign compared to the natural landscapes of Arrakis. But the techniques don't stop there, and something I actually don't see discussed as often as the other two is how the camera conveys a sense of scale. It's almost the last thing you notice after the infrared cameras and the design of the Harkonnen architecture, but it's actually the thing I would point to as having the biggest impact for why this feels so alien. Almost like a bass player in a band, you don't notice it when it's there, but you will notice it when it's not. Sorry bass players, I used to be a bass player. Denis Villeneuve and his team are absolute masters of portraying scale through images and cinematography as we've also seen in Blade Runner 2049. From a technical perspective, conveying a sense of scale has a lot to do with how the camera is framed and the type of focal length that's used. A focal length is usually measured in millimeters and refers to the point where the light meets inside the lens to the camera's sensor. Basically, cameras with a smaller focal length, such as 18 millimeters, gives us an image with a wide angle, whereas longer focal lengths, such as 200 millimeters, give us a narrower, compressed field of view, which is also known as telephoto. In other words, changing the camera's focal length makes the images feel bigger or smaller. If you want a bit more detail, I did make a video on how camera lengths affect perspective, which I'll link right here. To illustrate my point, I went ahead and tried to recreate the arena itself in Blender. So I've modeled everything here and I've got my little Fade Rotha and the Sea of Harkonnens and also of course the Baron up top. Now you'd think that using a wide angle would naturally make things feel bigger since it's in the name, but I find it to have the opposite effect. In the camera frame we can see almost everything and there's a lot of perspective distortion on the sides. Now look what happens when we increase our focal length to a telephoto. We're essentially limiting our view and now the rest of the arena spills outside of the frame. 
What's cool about the framing now is that we're being presented with an idea, that being that the arena is so massive that not even the camera can capture everything in one frame. But perhaps more subconsciously is that telephoto lenses by nature need to be used a distance away from our subject. For example, if I try to capture this cube here using two different lenses and have the cube take up the same space in both frames, I'll need to move my telephoto lens far back like this in order to do so. And of course, in real life, this is achieved by actually physically moving far away from the subject. We also see telephoto lenses being used in sporting events or wildlife photography where the camera person can't physically be close to the action for whatever reason. So either this is because the sporting game is actually going on or if you get too close to a line, you're gonna get eaten. So in order to take these photos, a telephoto lens is necessary because it gives us that zoom. What I'm trying to say is that telephoto is used in Fade's fight sequence multiple times as a way of signaling to us that there is a vast distance between where the camera is placed and where our subjects lie. Now, this shot in particular is probably my favorite in the entire sequence. There's so many different things being conveyed here in a single image and it's just so juicy to break down. You can see Fade here as he's walking, lifting his arms up and we get this nice slice of light down here that kind of signals that he's the victor. We also have these weird guard dudes here signaling their champion. And the reason that this shot is so effective is because look at everything that's on display here in terms of scale. So obviously we've got Fade in the foreground and then as it goes by, we know roughly that these are all people. And this entire Colosseum continues going up and up and up all the way here until we're meted with these giant pillars in the distance. And again, from a story perspective, all of this is for one person, which really sets up Fade as our villain. Another shot from earlier in the sequence is this one here where we look at Fade from the point of view of the Baron. This is also another great example because this slice of light here helps to break up this image just a little bit. It still implies that the sun is just outside of this section and Fade is it completely in shadow but he is tiny in this frame here and everything surrounding him is just that white sand that's in the gladiatorial arena now all of this to say look how much space he has to work with in this fight sequence we also see something similar on arrakis when paul rides the sandworm for the first time by shrinking our character and making them small in the frame by comparison it makes the environments feel massive so with all of these techniques being used together, Denis and his team have created what I find to be the most captivating part of the Dune movies. I've honestly never seen anything else like it, and when you consider the story implications and parallels Fade has to Paul, it's a masterclass in number one, setting up our antagonist, number two, showing his motivations, and also eventually setting up that climactic fight. If you would like to download my Blender file of the Harkonnen arena and just kind of mess around in it, I'm gonna link it down in my gum road for free. Anyway, everyone, that's going to be it for this art analysis. I hope you learned something, and until next time, take care and stay safe. Listen, Al-Gayib.